welcome to the Fab Lab, second day, day number two. Um, every, every morning at Enseca, it's exciting and a little bit harder to get up, but then we all do it because it's going to be so great. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so this is the, the uh, third year of a three-year project collaboration between Enseca and West Virginia University. Uh, my name is Kelly O'Brien. I teach at the University of Dallas, and uh, I am the Fab Lab coordinator. Um, <clears throat> I invite you to check out our exhibition in the atrium out there that's sort of some uh, work in progress and examples of pieces that our presenters in here have made collaboratively as they prepared for this, uh, this year's Enseca. Um, I'd like to introduce our first uh, presenters this morning from the Manchester Craftsman's Guild. Uh, Jill Wiggins is an artist, a teacher, and a database administrator at uh, the Manchester Craftsman's Guild. She's a graduate of uh, West Liberty State College and is an award-winning digital filmmaker. As a teacher, Jill is ambitious and believes in helping her students realize their maximum potential. Her recent passions include teaching 3D modeling and printing, laser engraving and CNC routing to create art at the Manchester Craftsman Guild Tech Suite. I'd also like to introduce two former students, uh, Jolie Valentine and Kayla Washington. Uh, Jolie is the coordinator, uh, exhibitions coordinator at Manchester. She's also an artist of ceramics and painting. And Kayla is a, also a former student in 3D printing and photography and is currently a local artist. So um, I'm going to turn it over to you all. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Jolie Valentine. Uh, I work at Manchester Craftsman's Guild as their uh, visiting artist and exhibition coordinator. I'm going to apologize right off the bat. Dave Diley, our vice president, was going to give this part of the presentation, but he pulled out his back this morning. So, <laughs> um, really quickly, I just want to describe Manchester Craftsman's Guild to you if you're not familiar. This image right here is of our tech suite. Uh, it was renovated about two years ago, and it includes now 3D printers laser engravers, and then also um, we just got a CNC machine, as well as other digital programs, Photoshop, uh, video programs, um, the whole Adobe suite, everything like that. So that's just what that image is showing. This is where our students do their 3D printing and modeling with Jill and a couple other instructors, um, just to give you that idea. But Manchester Craftsman's Guild also offers four, three other studios, ceramics, uh, photography, both darkroom and digital, as well as design arts. And so we kind of encompass all visual arts at the Manchester Craftsman's Guild. All classes are completely free to Pittsburgh Public School students, including transportation, materials, um, any class that they want to take, they can come up to three days a week from 3 to 5.30 every day um, and try all of the different studios. And so our ceramic studio is kind of what started the entire guild with our founder, Bill Strickland. And the next slide, yep. So on your left is Frank Ross, and on your right is Bill Strickland. Bill Strickland is our founder and CEO. He's going to be honored um, tonight. And so our whole method at Manchester Craftsman's Guild is the idea of mentorship. So Frank Ross was his mentor all through high school, and that is kind of what inspired him to begin a ceramic studio for urban youth in the north side. Um, and this is the first building that Bill bought and, be, and created a pottery studio for kids in the north side. Um, and he would just open the garage door, well there's no garage door, but he'd open the door and he'd say, hey, what are you doing? Come in here, let's throw pots. And he'd kind of give them that same experience that he had with uh, Frank Ross when he was a young adult, um, which inspired him then to become the CEO of, a, of Manchester Bidwell Corporation. There's a photograph of Bill, so if you see him around the building, say hi and say that this presentation was so amazing. Um, so thank you. Uh, <laughs> um, this is our building in the north side. Um, it includes the four studios that I described, as well as an adult training facility where there are things like the culinary program, medical coding and records, and the adult training facility is also free um, to people that are accepted to it. So it's a huge opportunity for people in Pittsburgh, um, and that is why we are here today. And I'm not sure what the next slide is. Let me see. OK. Um, our three core principles at Manchester Craftsman's Guild. And, and you see MCG Youth and Arts. So we kind of rebranded as MCG Youth and Arts. And so when you see that, that's Manchester Craftsman's Guild. Um, our three core principles are that environment shapes behavior. Um, in our building, we don't have cameras, security. You know, you're not walking through metal detectors. We just ha uh, kind of operate under the idea that everybody that walks into the building deserves respect. And um, we expect respect in return. Um, I hope that made sense. Yeah. And 
so it's a it's an amazing place. There's light. It's beautiful. Um, and so we just want someone to. Bill's theory is if you build prisons, you make prisoners. So we are kind of this really open environment. Everyone is welcome. Um, individual, individuals are li assets, not liabilities. Like I said, everyone that walks into the building is uh, met with a greeting and a hello and how are you? Welcome. What can we do for you? Um, so that's just kind of how we operate there. And creative imagination fuels enterprise. So we encourage our youth to be creative in our four studios, and we hope that they then pursue either a creative um, endeavor in their future, or you know, go on to college, go on to a training facility, anything like that. So we're there really to just support them uh, to be the best people that they can be in their future. And if you are interested in that story. Bill wrote a book, Make the Impossible Possible. Um, you can find it on the website, you can find it on Amazon, you can find it anywhere. It's an amazing book, it's a great story, so I really encourage you to read it. Um, and then also visit us at the Manchester Craftsman's Guild while you're here. Uh, we have a reception tonight from 6 to 9 p.m. Um, so thank you so much, and I believe now I am passing it off. No, I'm not, oof, woof. <laughs> All right, preparing the model for casting. This is why we're here. So our project was um, casting faces uh, and creating ceramic like faces from them. So instead of using the original method, which is you have to like wrap people's face, you put that, you start to like put the oil on their face and then you put the um, plaster paper on it. It's not comfortable for the model. Um, it's a slow, incredibly slow process. Uh, and then you also have to have them sit there with tubes coming out of their nose. Um, which is very uncomfortable and gross. Uh, so we kind of thought, wow, let's use 3D printing and modeling and scanning to kind of cr do the same process, but a lot cleaner and easier, and it's more fun. You can do more people at one time. Um, so this is kind of what Kayla Washington, our former student, is gonna describe to you. Um, she's the pro on this subject. They're the final products, so we'll see that. This is Kayla. Thank you so much for bearing with me. <laughs> um, so I'm going to pass it off to her. Yeah. Hello, everyone. My name is Kayla. I'm a former student at MCG, and I also volunteer after school with the kids now to keep involved because I love them. They're great. Um, um, I worked with them with 3D printing a lot. I was kind of their guinea pig for their test program. We worked with the additive project that created curriculum in 3D printing for students. Yeah. Um, this is some of my beginning work. I love making like weird creatures out of shapes in 3D modeling. I don't know. Kind of cool. I guess I have some examples up here for finished ones. This one's like a cat robot thing. <laughs> I don't know. And this one's like a little bunny. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, after our tech suite was opened, Joe Lee had showed you the pictures on the screen, we were able to invite the funders into our studio and teach them how to make things. So we had about three or four of them in the studio, and we just taught them how to make keychains and showed them the programming and showed them everything that they had helped us create at MCG. And then when we finally were able to open the studio, we had a ribbon cutting with Bill Strickland and Dave Diley, who was unfortunately not able to make it here with us today. And we cut the ribbon and opened the studio officially to all the students. Um, yeah, we were all really excited about it. <laughs> um, I was wondering if I could have a volunteer come down to scan. Um, All right. Thanks. Okay, I'm gonna. I'm just gonna jump in shortly here. Um, so, volunteer, would you please have a seat? I might need oh. that. Yeah, just out of the way. Okay, so I just wanted to help do a quick demo on how to 3D scan. Um, we use a very simple economical system. We use an iPad. Um, you can get iPads 300 and up. Um, and we use the occipital structure sensor scanner and it runs about $400. So you can have a, a scanning system for less than $1,000. And we use all freeware to process our scans. So I'm going to put this down and I'm going to start to scan our volunteer.
Uh, she asked, what's the software that you're using, Jill? To process the models, um, we, Mesh Mixer. We are covering it, yeah. Mesh Mixer. Yeah. Could you plug that in for me, please? Yeah. You know, the other way. Yep. And then that piece goes into the scanner here. Okay. Yeah. Are you? Okay. We're live. Okay. So, um, I don't expect you to be able to see this very well, but it's a really simple process. A box appears in the middle of the screen. And you can make the box bigger or smaller. And you just want your subject to be in the box. And you'll see they'll turn red if they're inside the box. So, a couple things about scanning. I should probably use that just for a minute. Just a couple quick things about scanning. Uh, we can't scan reflective surfaces. So if somebody wears glasses, we ask them to take them off because it doesn't work. Or anything really, really shiny or glittery. So I'm going to ask our subject to sit extremely still. Now, um, it's imperative to have a, a chair with a back because we sway. And she's going to move even though she doesn't think she moves. <laughs> So um, I'll be as quick as I can so she doesn't have to sit for too long. So while Jill is doing that, um, we have a reception this evening at Manchester Craftsman's Guild from 6 to 9 p.m. for Funk American Dada, uh, which is 10 African American artists. And we also have Found Again, which is five artists working with found objects in clay. So it'll be really fun. And if you're available tonight, I invite you to come. I'm having a little bit of a glitch. Doesn't want to stay connected. Uh, oh, well. Thank you, anyhow. Uh, <laughs> The good thing is that I have a slide of what it looks like when you're, when you're done. So these are examples of what it looks like on your screen. So as you're scanning the person, they turn white. They like turn into these like marble looking statues. And anything that's not white hasn't been scanned yet. So you know, you just have to work your way around. And of course there's a limit. The box, you know, they, they get cut off. The, the bottoms of the models are always ragged. So they, they have to be edited, and they're hollow inside. So I'm going to pass this on to Kayla. She's going to explain to you the process, because she's our digital master here. So she's going to explain the process of editing these scans to create something printable. Okay. Um, to start the process, we open mix Mesh Mixer. Um, that's what we use to edit any of our scans. Um, when we open that, we open our finished scan, and it looks a hot mess. It's all raggedy and weird. Um, and to fix that, we start with making it solid, which will fill in any of the hollow bits and will make it just easier to work with to start. And once it's solid, then we start cutting it. Um, we use a plain cut, and then first we'll cut it flat to cut the face. So it will start this cut to cut everything off the back. And then we'll use another cut to cut the face off and the body off. So I'll end up with a shape just like this. This is all we want for our mold is just the face. So it's pretty much we use three straight cuts to cut off all the bits. And we're left with a flat face. Yeah. And then once we're done with that, we just export it as an STL and it'll be ready for printing. Back to Jolie. Okay. Um. <laughs> The next process then happens in the ceramic studio, so I'm sure you're all more familiar with that process. Um, it's when we're gonna make our mold. So we set up our coddles and we 
put the we put the mold in with the clay around it, and then we start to pour the plaster in to make the mold. Um, then obviously let it dry. We remove it. This this mold took probably like two or three days of sitting in front of a fan to even dry before we could even start to use it. Um, after that, obviously we pour in the slip into the cast, uh, and then we let that set up. We then very, very gently remove the, the cast that we had created. And that is right here. So when you're done, you can come up and touch. This is the greenware of the cast. Um, this is where it was bisked. And then we, we glazed and fired it. So, um, so we made three from this, this particular mold. Um, so that was that process, which I'm sure you're more familiar with uh, than maybe the 3D printing and modeling. And it's kind of interesting, you'll see too, as you get further down the process, the, the mold lines from the 3D print, which you have like the kind of lines that the 3D printer creates, kind of start to disappear once it's in the glaze process. But once it's greenware, you can still see exactly all those tiny little lines. Yeah, and just a couple more things real quick. So um, this is actually something newer that we started this year, and we haven't even taught the kids this process yet. We plan on doing a collaborative class in the fall between ceramics and digital arts. And so we have some great ideas, uh, you know, creating like um, the wall hangings, uh, the ceramic wall hangings, and we'd like to even make them as shelves and you can set things on them or set things down in them. Uh, planters, making planters out of these spaces. So we've got some really cool ideas that we're looking forward to um, implementing in the fall. So um, please do follow us. Uh, we're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and of course on the web. So um, I'd like to open it up to questions right now. If anybody has any questions, yes. Uh, he just asked um, about the the what these are made of. The 3D printed pieces. These are ABS plastic. They were printed on the U print. It's a it's a 3D printer made by Stratasys. It's our Cadillac of or a Mercedes-Benz, maybe, of, of printers. We have a lot of cheap printers, but... Is that the one in the picture there? Is it a big white one? Yeah. Oh, those are little. Oh. Those are little. Those are... U-prints are only about this. I mean, the... Which ones? Oh, those are the Ultimakers. They're, they're only about this high. The U-print is... Uh, it's industrial, so... It's pretty big. Yeah. So, any other questions? Yes? Is there anything you have to do to the plastic? Uh, do you have to put oil over it or anything to keep it from sticking to the plaster? Yeah, uh, uh, they do. What do they put in to prep the... Yeah. Um, so she asked if you put anything on the print before you make the mold, uh, and he put on Murphy's oil soap pretty, pretty heavily. Um, yeah, the U-print is, is the only one that we use ABS on. It's a very, it's an enclosed system. Um, are you familiar with ABS and PLA? So yeah, um, most of our other printers are open and we use PLA on them. The ABS, if you use it on an open printer, for those of you who don't know, ABS um, has toxic odors. <laughs> so um, the U-print is enclosed and we don't have any problem with, um, with the fumes but otherwise we use all PLA because it's corn-based. It's a natural-based filament. Any other questions? Oh yeah, last year um, we had cookie cutters running. I don't know if you saw, we have a teeny, teeny, tiny printer over there. It's a $300 printer called the M3D and um, it's really great because you can travel with it. You can take it on an airplane. And, and we, we were printing cookie cutters and, you know, ribs and... Um, we also did, um, in this printer, extruder bits. Uh, so they, yeah, so they, they kind of created a, a, a piece that would come out of the extruder. They designed it themselves and then, yeah, so. We don't hear, no. Yeah, we didn't bring any. So if they're over here, they might be from another another organization. Yeah. Anybody else? Yes. 
how many students are currently in our program? Uh, we, you know, we typically have, what, about a hundred and... Well, if... if so we have multiple programs. They run throughout the day, and then our after school is our flagship program. In our after school program, probably anywhere like about 200 students enrolled, um, and then our day programs, maybe about 100 that are coming in through, throughout the week. Um, our our funder or our founder is really good at um, getting grants, and we we have a full development team, and that's their primary job. We get foundation grants. Um, we used to get a lot of state funding. We do get some local funding, Allegheny County funding, but um, yeah, it's a lot of work to keep the place going. But um, we still somehow manage. It, people come through. Because they love Bill and they love what we do there, so we're very fortunate. Anybody else? Well, I'd like to thank you. Oh, I have one more question. okay. Uh, is it Kayla? Is it Kayla. Kayla. Yes. Uh, how has this project changed your life from what you would have been had you not had this project? Um. That's a good question. The question was, how did the project change your life from what you may have been doing? Um, I started doing this 3D printing. They asked me to start this when I was about 14 or 15. Um, and it took like half my summer. And I just, I love it. I work on a 3D printing when I'm at home. Um, I go to MCG and work on it. I feel like it makes me so, more, so much more creative because I'm always thinking of how I can help my life, fix my life with 3D printing problems and stuff like that. It's just, it makes me think so much more creatively. It's, I don't know, it's just amazing. It's such an amazing process and a tool that you can have in your life to just take an idea, say, I used to make um, shelves and little like holders for my phone to charge it. I would think of, oh, how could I attach this to my wall or hook it to something? And I would take that thought and I would open the computer and open the pro like the program we used one two three D design, and I would open that and I would just make it, and then a couple of days later I would have it, and there, it's just it's great. Uh, I probably would have a lot more problems in my life if I <laughs> wasn't able to three D print stuff. So yeah, no problem. Uh, you know what, we used to use 123D Design, but they stopped, like, they're not making it anymore, and so we're switching to Fusion 360 kind of in the process. Um, if you're an educator or a student, you can download, download it for free. It's a really robust program. It'll do just about everything. It will, you can do solid modeling, you can do mesh modeling that's more like a ceramics organic process, um, y and you can do parametric modeling with it. Um, yeah, it's, it's really great. And I'm trying to think, we used to use an uh, online program, it was a parametric, it was called shapeshifter.io, that's the name of the website. I think it is still up. It's a really cool program that you can use to make vessels and apply patterns to the outside of the vessels. So that's a pretty cool program. And sometimes our kids will um, we'll, we'll show them Tinkercad because they can access that from anywhere online. So Tinkercad, I think it's tinkercad.org maybe, .com. So that's a, yeah, and, and it's nice because they can store all their projects in the cloud and access them from anywhere. So it's pretty cool. Yeah. No. Yes. Mm -hmm. He was just asking if the if the the pieces, the kitty cats, the robots were made from molds, and they were not. And and one thing we're learning, um, which is kind of interesting now, working together with the ceramic studio and the digital studio, is that when and I'm sure you know from making molds, you know you can't have the undercuts. If we're just trying to make a simple mold, we can't have the undercuts. So it's kind of been this interesting process where the digital artists you know, like send, send the, the 3D print and, you know, we have to then examine it and say like, this isn't gonna work, or this isn't gonna come out. So um, it's, 
it's an interesting process for both students from both studios to begin to understand how the pro like their process works, which is, you know, they're just going to scan the face and they're going to make it clean and everything, but then we get it and we say, like, you can't have the undercuts. And so then they both get to learn, okay, what is an undercut, what's going to work in a mold and what isn't. Um, you can recycle it. We haven't found a local place yet. There probably is by now. The last time I looked, I didn't. Yep. Yeah. No, I mean, not as far as I know. We, we've bought most of our filament, I think, fresh. I don't think it's been recycled filament, but I, I do know they make it, and I do know the filament can be recycled. Um, if you know of any place that recycles uh, used filament, let, let us know because we'd like to recycle ours, that, our waste for sure. You know what, we've bought from, okay, so we have, we have three MakerBot printers, so we, we buy some filament. We bought filament from, from MakerBot. And then we also buy from, comp oh, it's MakerShed, I believe. I think we've bought a lot of our filament from MakerShed. They have a nice variety and it seemed pretty reasonably priced. For, it depends on your printer. He wants to know what, so the intermediate step after modeling before printing is the slicing software. So every printer has slicing software that it's compatible with. And so MakerBot is proprietary. We have to use the MakerBot slicing software to prep it for printing. Um, some of our other printers like the PrintRBot and the Ultimakers, we do use Cura software. And uh, the U-Print has proprietary software that we have to use, which is Catalyst EX. Yep. So, yes? Have you ever done projects with the students where they make a mod or a cut and then they make a mold and print it in? We've had them model cups and mugs, but we haven't taken it to the mold process yet. So... Yeah, that's one of the exercises that we use to, um, like we'll take a cup and this is how they learn how to use the di digital calipers. So they take all the measurements of the cup with the digital caliper and then they have to recreate it in modeling software. So it just gets them used to taking measurements, uh, the depth, the diameter, um, and the shape of, of the handle. Just, you know, it's, it can be pretty interesting. So far, that's that's what we've that's how we've done our cup making primarily. I mean, kids will get a little free form and they'll say, "Ah, I just want to make a cup," and they just do it however they like it. But um, yeah, that was just a directed project that I did one day. I, you know what? I mean, we did have kids uh, print out cookie cutters that they took home to to make cookies. Whether that happened, I don't know, but they did make cookie cutters for making cookies. Yeah, you know, uh, he just made a good point. He said, you know, he wonders about food safe, um, with his food safety as far as the PLA goes. And the PLA is, um, I mean, it is corn-based, but it's porous. Most 3D printing processes result in a porous uh, model. So uh, it's typically not a good idea to use it for food. They do make food safe uh, or food grade filament. Yeah, they actually do. I've never used it, but I've seen it. So, I think I think so. Yeah. Yes. If uh, an old guy like me wanted to learn the program, how long would it take to figure out how to make a robot? Do you want to address that? Yeah. Um, I think like if you're using like something like one two three design, it's all just shapes. 
if you know your shapes and how to make them a little bigger, a little smaller, tweak them a little bit, it shouldn't take too long. Um, it's very simple. Like, take um, this for example. It's pretty much all just primitive shapes. Like, this was a rectangle that I just rounded the edges. These are just um, cones. This is a circle with a circle cut out of it. Another rounded rectangle. Um, a cylinder with rounded edges. It's just and pretty much. It's all just very simple. Um, when we started that, when I started working with additive projects, we started learning like the basic like steps of how to use like one two three design and learning how to use it. It was so easy, and that's why I loved it so much. It was just simple, and then it becomes fun because it's so easy to do. So you'll get it, I promise. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, I mean, ideally, they take it through from beginning to end, you know, so they get to see the process. I always am looking over their shoulder just so they don't accidentally print solid or, you know, because then we're, <laughs> we're burning up filament really fast if that happens. And so, yeah, like, you just, um, yeah, we, it, it's important that they understand each, each step in that process, we think, you know. So just be there with them, you know, make sure. Things don't go crazy. <laughs> okay, well, thank you everyone for coming today. It's been awesome.